Hey everybody, welcome to the Gym Masters Show Live. It's great to have you with us. Hope everybody is doing well today. It is Thursday. Hope you had a good day. If you didn't, well, you know where we are. We're right here on the Gym Masters Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series to perk up your spirits with our light, love, and levity, or as we've coined it a couple of months ago here on the series, Lovity. You guys are the Lovities, the viewers from all around the world. You've sort of... Uh, Dubbed me Mr. Lovity. Our guests are part of Lovity Hall. <laughs> it's really cool. We, we're loving this, and we are in our 28th week, uh, some 200-plus episodes every single day, just about, of uh, great entertainment, conversation, viewer interaction, and lots more. Lots of surprises all the time as we prepare this show and uh, join you. As you know, it's an extension of my professional work as a television and radio personality and host. And uh, we designed this show to lighten the load each day for everybody, inform, educate, entertain, and have a good time doing it. And uh, boy, did we have a good time last night. Now, I know YouTube had some sort of a crazy uh, worldwide sort of takedown or something. I don't know. They had some sort of a weird thing that happened. Um, Something took them off the air or whatever it is on YouTube last night. But uh, we had a great guest on last night, uh, actor Glenn Scarpelli, who you remember from uh, One Day at a Time on CBS. And of course, many other uh, productions, Love Boat, MacGyver, on and on and on. He was terrific. And if you missed the episode, it's on our YouTube channel at Gym Masters TV. Glenn is a dear friend and uh, we chatted for good amount of time. He opened up about his whole life and about uh, the incredible things he's doing where he lives in Sedona, Arizona. And it was a pleasure having him on last night. Uh, we welcome all of you from all around the world. We cheer you and you and you and you. Hope you're having a good day. Just a little Trader Joe's lemonade. It always hits the spot. Just so, I know it looks fancy and expensive in this glass, doesn't it? Just a little Trader Joe's lemonade to uh, spike up the evening a little bit. We'll see how everybody's doing. We've got an amazing guest coming on who is a veteran uh, in the industry of acting and singing, directing as well. He's been in some of the most incredible and brilliant productions, uh, Robert Cuccioli, and uh, he's an actor, a singer, a director extraordinaire, and he'll be gracing our airwaves in just a second as our special guest. Let's welcome some of our viewers watching from all around the world on YouTube and Facebook tonight on Jim Masters TV. Hello, Jim. With pleasure, I watch your show again along with your fan base because you're so good. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. As my father has always said, when somebody pays you uh, a kind word, ask them to put it in writing and address it management. <laughs> Thanks, Willie. 1 a.m. there in the Netherlands as you watch our series. We appreciate that very much. I hope you're having a good day. Christine Clifton, good evening, Jim, and lovely friends. We welcome actor-singer Robert Cuccioli to the show tonight. An entertaining conversation is ahead in Lovely Hall. You got it. And hope things are okay for you in North Carolina. I know that uh, Hurricane Tropical Storm Eta came up through Florida, Georgia, Carolinas, and did some damage through the Carolinas. We were watching that on the news as we were preparing the show today and hope you guys are doing well, Christine and everybody in the Carolinas uh, and the South. Uh, Mary Bishop is here in Florida. Hello, Jim and Lovelace. Looking forward to another night of positivity. Absolutely. Watching on the YouTube channel. Good evening, Jim and all Lovelace. Happy Thursday. It's good to see you as well. And Wozniak. We love when you're here. And uh, oh boy, we have a lot of great folks here. Jason Communications, master your power. Hi, Jim. It's Jill Jason. She's watching right now. We appreciate that. Watching on the YouTube channel. Make sure you love that YouTube channel. If you haven't done it already, subscribe. We love that. Renee Oscom is here from Iowa. Good to see you in Iowa. Hope you guys are doing okay in Iowa. I know COVID is spiking there right now in Iowa. Pretty tough. Uh, the whole country. Uh, not the world is having a tough time. So you guys hang in there, but I hope you're doing well and hope you're having a good day. Renee, it's nice to see you here. Tulips from Willie and Holland. Merlin is here from Interkip, Ontario, Canada. Hi, Jim and all loveties. It's great to see you here. Merlin, hope you were doing well. I know things are spiking, they said now in Canada as well. Hope you guys fare okay. Avril is in the United Kingdom there in Hampshire in England. Hi, Jim and all the loveties. Hope you have a good day today. It's good to see you as well. Marsha Murphy Watson is here. Good evening to all. Good evening to you as well, Marsha. Kathleen Walker in New York City is here. Hi, Jim. Hope all is well. Hi, everyone. Good to see you, Kathleen. 
Ralph Lampkin Jr. is here. Good evening from Indiana, South Bend. Good to see you, Ralph. Flower Power is here. She's kitchen dancing. She always dances when our theme song plays to our show in the beginning and at the end. She's either kitchen dancing or living room jumping around, or I think you said you wiggle in the bed too, if you're still in the bed, right? <laughs> she loves our theme. Hi, Jim and everyone. Happy Thursday. Hope you're having a fantastic day. Looking forward to an exciting show with inspiring conversation and lovely Crystal Nolan, who's watching in Connecticut. Love that. From South Africa, Juanita is here. Hello, Jim and everyone. Good to see you, Juanita. Thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure to have you here, Juanita. And uh, yes, yes, there was actually a YouTube outage uh, yesterday as well. Uh, YouTube is where we house everything and we're building the YouTube channel. So a lot of it is happening on YouTube. Cheers, Crystal Nolan. Yes, you've got, oh, wow, you're watching in 3D. <laughs> I better step back. What do you mean you're watching us in 3D? <laughs> Did we approve that? <laughs> That's cool. You're on a monster TV, so my head must look like the size of, uh, <laughs> I don't know what. Good evening, fellow lovities from Karen Campbell Green from beautiful Nova Scotia and Marsha Murphy Watson. Oh, really terrific. Oh, that's you saw Jekyll and Hyde. Awesome. Sherry Show in line. Hello, all lovelies. Lovely hold this evening. So happy to be here again from West Central Ohio. Great comments coming in from everybody, everybody, everybody. And uh, yeah, you guys uh, in Iowa, Iowa is really, really spiking right now. So I hope you guys are doing okay. And uh, hello, Jim and fellow lovelies. Yes, no hat tonight. I know you said no hat. We gave the hat a little bit of a rest. We like to change things up, change up the look, change up everything. Hi, Jim and all our lovities. Marilyn Hammond in Wichita, Kansas, watching on YouTube. Good to see everybody. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're having a good day. And we thank you for joining us. And uh, our very special guest, Robert Cuccioli, is with us here. And again, he's been in so many different productions over the years. We're going to talk about some of these, just showing you a few of the incredible photos and productions. But uh, I want to tell you a little bit about his uh, amazing background. He's probably best known for his riveting, critically acclaimed Tony-nominated performance as mad scientist Dr. Jekyll and his sinister alter ego, Mr. Hyde, in uh, the smash Broadway hit musical Jekyll and Hyde, for which he also received the Drama Desk Outer Circle, uh, Critic Circle Award and Fanny Awards, too, for Outstanding Actor in a Musical. Prior to his successful Broadway run, he dazzled audiences as well as critics alike across America in the show's national touring company. He was honored with Chicago's prestigious Joseph Jefferson Award during Jekyll and Hyde's successful 34-week tour. 2012, he returned to Broadway, lighting up the stage with his high-flying performance in the dual role of Dr. Norman Osborne and the Green Goblin in the rock musical Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark. Off Broadway, he was seen in Joe Pintero's Snow Orchid and in his critically acclaimed performance as Mayor Rothschild in the updated version of the classic uh, Harnick Bach musical Rothschild and Sons. And in 2017, Robert starred as the title character in the New York Times critic pick White Guy on the Bus at the 59E59 Theaters. While acting has always uh, been in his blood, it wasn't his first career. The Long Island native graduated from St. John's University with a bachelor's degree in finance and worked as a financial consultant on Wall Street at the prestigious investment firm E.F. Hutton. Are you listening? I said E.F. Hutton. <laughs> when E.F. Hutton speaks, everybody listens. I used to love those commercials. Uh, he did that for three years while pursuing a full-time uh, performing career. At age 23, he auditioned and received an offer to join the Light Opera of Manhattan, starring in the chorus. His uh, work brought him starring roles in the most beloved Gillard and Sullivan operettas and such classics as The Merry Widow, The New Moon, the Desert Song and the Vagabond King and so much more. Robert received the first big break playing Lancelot to legendary Richard Harris as King Arthur in the national and Canadian tours of Camelot and so much more. It's my pleasure to welcome him to the show uh, live and direct here on the program, Robert Cuccioli. Robert, thank you very much for joining us here on the show. It is a pleasure to welcome you. And how are you, my friend? <laughs> I'm great. I'm great, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. And hello to all 
I guess I'm a, an honorary Lovity now, right? So you, hello to all my fellow Loveties. You are a Lovity, absolutely. <laughs> They've already deemed you that. And Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, of all the awards and accolades, that's the one you've been waiting for all your life is to be a Lovity on the Gym Master Show Live, right? It, I didn't know it until now, but yes, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> well, here we go. Sherry says uh, you're a lovety as well. And uh like to show some of these cool viewer comments because they love to welcome everybody. Uh, Tess LaBella, wonderful actress and comedian. And uh, boy, does she make a mean chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> She's a voice actor too in Florida. Welcome, Robert. This is going to be another fabulous show. Hello, uh, Tess. Thank you. And uh, Mary Bishop says, welcome, Robert, Thank as you, well. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. And uh, Merlin, who is in Canada, welcome, Robert, to Lovety Hall. Hi, Crystal, Merlin. Crystal in Connecticut. Hi, Robert. Welcome to Lovety Hall. Hi, Crystal. Kathleen in New York City. Hi, Robert, and welcome. Juanita from South Kathleen, Africa. Kathleen, Juanita, hi. Yeah, all the way from South, South Africa. South Africa. Oh, my gosh. We we went there. Um, Lila and I went there not, oh, uh, it was four years ago? Maybe, did you? We to, yeah, we went to Cape Town. Oh yeah, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we went on a safari also up in uh, Kruger National Park. It was the most phenomenal experience the whole the whole time there. Such a that beautiful is, country. It really, really is. Mm -hmm. I have yet myself to get there. I'd love to get there soon. Hello, Robert. Welcome. Looking forward to an entertaining uh, evening with Ann Wozniak. I am. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, Jen, who is in uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania, she's Zen. She says, we're looking great on her big screen TV. Oh, my. <laughs> so, and, more of me than you ever needed to see. Yeah, okay. I was going to say, she's got us in 3D <laughs> on top of it. <laughs> wow. Sherry says, welcome, Robert, to Lovely Hall. So excited that you're here with us tonight. Hi, Sherry. Willie in Holland at uh, 1 15 a.m. says, welcome, Robert, to the Gym Master Show, best show in the world. Thank you, Willie. Hey, Willie. Uh, yes, Tess says you're a, a lovely now, Robert. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, welcome, Robert, from Renee in uh, Iowa. Thank you, Renee. And Sherry says you are definitely a lovely now. Uh, hey, Robert <laughs> from, uh, <laughs> hey, Rob, it's like roll call at the Waltons. Uh, hey, Robert uh, from Jennifer. And Jennifer. And Marilyn in Wichita, Kansas. Welcome, Robert. You're a lovety now. Thank Christine, you, Marilyn. Christine Clifton. Welcome, Robert, to the Gym Master Show Live. You are now a lovety. Happy you could join us tonight. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Kathleen Walker, welcome to our lovety family. Wow. How are we going to top that, <laughs> Robert? <laughs> I don't know. Let's find something. That's it. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to be a long night, Jim. I was going to say, that's uh, <laughs> all this love coming in here. Now, it's actually commonplace on our show. That's what happens, and we love that. And it's sort of the, the community that we've created here of positivity. And we, we talk about a myriad of different things. Every day, it's something different, different topics, different entertainment and conversation and uh, very happy that you could join us. I know it's been a busy time for you. You're you're working on some projects. How have you been, Robert? What are some of the things that you've been doing? You know, you're ever the performer and you like to be out there and connected and on stages and sets and then studios. Uh, not a lot of that happening because of everything that's going on right now. And as things tick upwards, as they're saying, we're having to hunker down a little bit more. What have you been doing to, to stay creative and connected? You know, um, I've been doing a lot of benefits, um, raising money for the Actors Fund, uh, for other institutions, for theaters themselves, uh, because it's uh, it, everyone is really struggling right now. And, um, and it's important for all of us to band together and to help one another. Um, uh, by the way, I, I love your your theme of positivity because I think that you know it's something that is is so m missing uh, and also so necessary yeah. uh, in people's lives, and they and they they need that they need that level of positivity that um, that helps buoy you know through these really challenging times. And uh, so, yeah, I've been doing a lot of uh, benefits, um, recordings, you know, uh, 
uh, myself singing or doing uh, public service announcements or things like that, uh, uh, recording myself on my phone and then um, having that sent in. I've uh, also been doing a lot of uh, Zoom readings, which I can't say I'm a big fan of, but, yeah. but at least it's a way to, um, it's a way to uh, help um, writers uh, work on their their plays on their musicals um, and also it's a chance to work on creating characters it's to keep your muscle uh, you know flexed right and otherwise we all get stale we've been sitting sitting around you know stressing and watching yeah. TV and the news and everything and just stressing and then stressing some more and it's you need that outlet you need an outlet and it's you need to keep creating and Absolutely. so I've been doing a lot of that, yeah. Mm -hmm. I knew Merlin would chime in quickly with singing. What kind of music? <laughs> in about five minutes, she's going to ask you to sing. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, well, no. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I like that. Yeah, but no. <laughs> he covered both bases there. Yeah, but no. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it's been, you know, it's been um, things from pop to Broadway. Yeah. Uh, so it's all uh, all sorts of all sorts of music and, and even some gospel. So yeah, yeah, uh, a whole bunch of different things. Absolutely. Uh, Juanita has chimed in from South Africa. She says, "We do have a beautiful country." Thanks, Robert. I'm in Cape Town at the moment, overlooking Table Mountain. Yes. Yeah, that's nice. And Marsha Murphy Watson says she screamed at you, and for <laughs> you and Broadway and Jekyll and Hyde, you were wonderful. That was you. Did you remember that scream? That was you. I remember yeah. that scream. <laughs> <laughs> All the glass on set smashed from the scream. <laughs> no, they just kind of vibrated a little bit. Nothing cracked. That's it. <laughs> so uh, I mentioned that you're from uh, Long Island, New York, yeah. uh, which is where I originally hail from as well. And oh, you are from where? Yeah. Uh, Mineola first and then out towards Suffolk County, Smithtown area, North Shore. I've got cousins in Mineola, yeah. Oh, really? Yep. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, so where are you in the city now? I am. Yes. Did you leave the city at all? No. So you stayed. We yeah. stuck it out. Yeah. yeah. How's it, out. it been? Uh, it, was, um, it was a challenging time for quite a while. But, you know, we would uh, sit every morning and uh, wait for... Uh, our governor, Andrew Cuomo, to get on and do his press briefing. And we would watch that every single day. Yeah. And he guided us through. And uh, New Yorkers, God bless us, they they all pulled together, you know. And and, um, and we went through a couple of months, really, really tough time. I mean, it was it was uh, uh, kind of a ghost town around here. But now it's it's starting to it's life is happening again. And, you know, just like the rest of the country, things are starting to, uh, you know, get worse again. The, the virus is picking up. And so we all need to, you know, find a way to batten down the hatches one more time. And on our own, too, unfortunately. That's the yeah. problem. There's no, uh, no, you know, captain guiding the ship, unfortunately. And that's creating a huge Not right problem. now. Not right now, <laughs> but soon. But soon. <laughs> but soon. Come hell or high water. <laughs> uh, Jim Masters' show is all about positivity and levity and connecting and interacting with daily conversations through uh, his amazing show. Thank you, Christine. Speaking of high water in North Carolina, where she is, they just had that Ada, that Hurricane Ada, that sort of came through Cancun or whatever, it was through Mexico and then looped towards Florida. Yeah. Uh, it, it made it funny. Yeah, it like hit everybody. It uh, made landfall, I think, in Cuba and Puerto Rico, and uh, yeah, and then dodged back towards the Florida. So, uh, so that's terrific. So you're, you're, I know a lot of people that I've spoken to, especially on this series that I was mentioning to. We launched 28 years ago as a sidebar to, uh, I say a sidebar, but the amount of time and attention and preparation doing this show because we do it like a television show, not like a podcast. Uh, the amount of preparation is extreme as if this could be full time and jockeying this with all the other uh, work that I do. Um, and we've been doing this for about 28 weeks now, 200 plus episodes. A lot of uh, 
artists are saying um, they liked the electronic bit with the Zoom and the live stage stuff on you know online, but they're it's not they're getting bored with it. They're getting worn out by it. It's like okay, you know, I'm setting up my little camera and I got my little squares and I got my little lights and I'm doing my thing in an empty room or whatever. And it's, it's okay. And it's keeping being connected, but they're not loving it. Um, yeah. It's missing an element for me. Um, maybe because of being so intertwined in television and radio and being in studios and having equipment and technology and cameras and stuff, stuff maybe it came a little bit easier for me to do it. Uh, but still there is, you know, you like that audience. You like the, the other people around, the colleagues and the interaction, yeah. collaboration. Yeah. How about you? You mentioned that the Zoom is okay, but uh. well, it's it's very it's very challenging as a platform because uh, you don't get to like you were saying, you don't get to really interact with your fellow actors, and um, it's uh, it's a, it's a bit of a challenge that way, and and. Uh, you know, it's what's wonderful about your show is that you actually get to uh, interact with your guests live, uh, with, not your your guests, but with your audience live. Um, and, and as a and, hope, and hopefully the guests. <laughs> well, and hopefully the guests. Yeah, exactly. But uh, <laughs> as long as they don't have one word answers, <laughs> which could happen. And that's yeah, like, you become so Joaquin like, Phoenix in a, in yeah. a yeah. No. Uh, Do you sing? Yes. Do you act? Yes. Okay, yeah. a little bit more than that. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, it's it's difficult when you don't have an audience to yeah. to feed off of to really understand what's working and what doesn't work. Uh, even if you're doing a reading, you know, and not having that audience to really bounce off of. Um, but people have been getting really inventive. Uh, you know, it's. You you throw you throw a, a, a roadblock at a, someone who is creative, and they will find a way around it, through it, or over it. And uh, that has happened in a number of uh, a number of instances. And one in particular is uh, before uh, things shut down back in March, I was uh, prepared to open off Broadway at the Irish Rep in a show called A Touch of the Poet, which is a, uh, I guess it's a lesser known Eugene O'Neill piece. And uh, we went through four weeks of rehearsal and up to start tech and uh, everything got shut down. Mm. So the Irish rep decided that they would film it, um, which is interesting enough but how they decided to do that and not break people's quarantine or uh, whatever is that they shipped all of the necessary accoutrement to all the actors. That would be their costume, their set piece, their props, and their shared props, uh, a green screen, lighting equipment, and a cell phone stand because we would film on our cell phones and we would use zoom as a platform uh we put the, our computer behind the phone so the director could see what our frame was what we were shooting and we would hear our other actors that we would play against on zoom while we were acting the piece so it was almost like running your lines or rehearsing your lines in your living room by yourself in costume. Uh, and then we would send all that footage to the editor who brilliantly edited this into a film and actually found a way to, and there was a uh, backdrop, there was uh, the set designer created a, uh, a set on the green screen. Mm -hmm. So it looked like we were in a bar mm -hmm. and uh, the editor actually was able to put two or more actors in the scene together uh, on the screen. So uh, it still needed some finessing, but it's pretty miraculous what they were able to accomplish. And that just aired uh, maybe two weeks ago. Mm. 
And because of the um, uh, union guidelines, we had to work under a, a Screen Actors Guild contract, even though it was a stage piece. Uh, and they required it to only be air aired as a performance. So it could only be shown on Tuesday night at seven o'clock, Wednesday at three o'clock and at eight o'clock, Thursday at eight o'clock, Friday. At, you know, it had to be a performance week. Specific times, yeah. Yeah. So it only ran for a week. And, um, and that was it, unfortunately. But I think that they're trying to find a way to get it on... Um, on a streaming service of some sort, whether it's pay-per-view or something, so that it still may be, uh, stay tuned, everyone, because you may still get a chance to see it. Yeah, yeah, maybe Amazon Prime or some, yeah. so everything's going on Amazon Prime these days, it's incredible, they've become like at the forefront of a lot of productions, I noticed, Netflix too and Hulu, others, but yeah. this Amazon Prime is, they're really making inroads really aggressive. Yeah, there's some, there's some really good work being done on all those, services so how did you first get how did you make that transition from being in the financial world in new york on long island to wanting to also be the performer because you know we're talking about right brain left brain a lot yeah. and the merge of the two yeah uh, while you were doing that you were also you know training and getting involved in performance at the same time right yeah yeah uh well it was it, it was kind of temporary insanity and i haven't really I haven't, I haven't been cured yet. So uh, I, I but always... Your book, but your books are probably good. <laughs> yeah, I, I always performed when I was in uh, elementary school and in high school and in college. And, um, you know, I, whether it was glee clubs or uh, drama clubs, uh, I, I was in a rock band. Uh, I was in an acapella group. Uh, all sorts of things that I did for fun. And I never thought of doing it as a career. Right. I honestly never even thought it was a career uh, until I got to my senior year of college, and I was already on the the path of becoming, you know, I wanted to become a corporate lawyer, um, uh, studying in finance. And uh, I was doing a show my senior year, and um, people said, that "You're really good. Did you ever think of doing this as a career?" And that's when the light bulb went off. Mm. And I said, you know, if I don't give this a try, I'm going to say, what if all my life? And I don't want to live don't with that. that right. So I didn't know anybody in the business. I didn't know anything about the business. I didn't know where to start. It was all trial and error. And to be honest with you, it still is. Um, but I found a path. Uh, I found my way to the light opera of Manhattan which was a repertory company that did Gilbert and Sullivan and operettas 52 weeks out of the year. You did one show, uh, perform one show at night for two weeks. And while you were performing that, you were rehearsing the next one, which opened immediately after. So I had no training as an actor and I had no training yet as a singer, but I was, uh, I was blessed with a voice. So that got me the job. And, um, and, that was my training ground. Uh, the audience, we were talking about having a live audience, the audience taught me, you know, what worked, what didn't work. And also I, I really watched my fellow actors. Uh, when I wasn't on stage, I'd be in the wings and I'd watch them and see what were they doing that really worked and what do I like about that? And, what, and I learned from watching and and finally performing and then i eventually trained um and that that helped hone my craft uh, but i did both for a while i did i worked on wall street during the day and then i went up and worked and did shows at night and i did that for a year and a half until i couldn't do it anymore mm -hmm. and they caught on that i had i was doing something else at ef hutton and uh asked me you know are is what are you doing and i i I, I lied. I said I was in advertising. I was doing advertising. And uh, they they said, well, were you afraid you weren't going to get your bonus? And I said, yeah, because this was when things were getting iffy on Wall Street. And uh, so my boss said, well, here's your bonus, Bob. And I'm like, thanks, Jack. You have my two weeks notice. Mm. And that was it. And I never looked back. Mm. Yeah. I guess instead of when E.F. Hutton speaks. <laughs> yeah. When yeah, well, nobody... Speaks 
Nobody it listened to me. Listen. That's why I had a lead. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're trying to follow with the commercials. Hey, so, look, I had a, no one was listening to something else. Yeah, you're sitting on a train and you're talking to the other guy about EF hunting. Huh? Yeah, no, no, it didn't work that way. I still no. love those commercials. They were, they were cute. They were really classic. Um, so I mentioned a little bit in the introduction, some of the you know entree in. What were some of those earlier breaks that came along for you that you know really set the tone and guided you forward? Well, uh, working for uh, starting my career off with a light out in Manhattan, Manhattan certainly was one of those breaks. Um, I would say the next big break was when I got to um, I do the touring company of Camelot with Richard Harris and to play opposite him as Lancelot. Um, that was a that was a huge thing for me. That was a big that was a, a big bump for me in my career at the beginning of my career. Um, the next was when I did the Rothschilds off Broadway uh, and I played one of the sons. I played Nathan, the middle child. Um, and that kind of brought me brought me attention. And then working in the doing the world goes round. Mm. Um, that was another one that brought me uh, uh, that pretty much got my name starting to be talked about. And you're on the album as well. You have I to. am. Yeah. I am. And you get the big thing standing right up there. Yeah. 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 Uh, so that and then, you know, other things followed. And uh, I uh, 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 finally made my Broadway debut uh, in Les Mis. And that was interesting because Les Mis was something that I always wanted to be a part of. Yeah. Uh, ever since I heard the, I had my, my, um, my cassette tape. <laughs> There's probably some people on this. On I this, still that, have that know mine. that know what cassette tapes oh, are. Cassettes and reel to reels and albums still have them all. Yeah, so <laughs> I'll uh, throw them out. You still have your mixtapes too. <laughs> yeah, I listened. I listened to that until it, it it stretched out, and I always I knew that I needed to be in that show, and I always wanted to play Angel Ross, uh, the student leader, um, because I wanted to be the hero. Sure. You know, um, and I auditioned for that role six times and I never got hired. Wow. Never got hired. And I ended up auditioning for something else. It was a, it was another, it was a musical review and I can't remember the name of it, but the fellow who was the general manager of Les Mis mm. was the, one of the producers of this. And he was in the room when I auditioned and I gave one of the worst auditions of my life. Mm. And I left there with my tail between my legs and I was walking out the door and I heard the pitter patter of little footsteps behind me. And I turned around and it was this gentleman. His name is Richard J. Alexander. Oh, sure. And yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And he said, uh, Bob, you did great. You did great in there. But we have an opening coming up in Les Mis. Would you be interested in auditioning for Javert? And I was like, huh. Never thought of it never thought of it. So I said, sure. So I went in, I auditioned for that. And he said, you're gonna play this role. I'm not sure when yet, but you'll play this. And within like a month or so, he called me and, and said, we have an opening, will you come in and do it? Mm. So that's, it's, it was, it's odd how things just happen. You think you know yourself and you think you want something and the universe says, no, nah, yeah, but no. Nah. <laughs> right. There's something else better. Something else we have uh, yeah. set in mind for you. Were you sort of pinching yourself as these things were happening? Were you like, wow, you know, all this blood, sweat, and tears is starting to pay off. What I really dreamed of doing is actually some starting to come to fruition here. Yeah, I was pretty determined, um, and I was pretty focused on what I what I wanted, and and uh, and I didn't I didn't. I didn't fully know how it was going to pan out because like I said, I had no, I had no roadmap. Right. I had no, I had no one who was really fully guiding me. I had some mentors who were, who were teaching me and helping me along the way, but I didn't, I, I, I the, the map was completely blank and I was, I was drawing the path, you know, myself. And it was, it was exciting and scary, mm. but I did have people that were on my side. 
Were you focusing more on the acting or the singing or were both equal at that point, uh, Robert? I, like I said, I could always sing. Yeah. Um, I did begin to train as a singer to be get, to get better as a singer. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to be known as an actor. Yeah. Um, and I never forced, I, I never took my singing for granted. I always worked really, really hard on it. But I always wanted to be known as an actor, and and I spent a lot of my time and energy working on that, um, training for that, uh, and uh, that finally got a. I finally broke through. I mean, I, I've done a lot of really good roles in musicals, but um, when I worked at the uh, Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey, doing a musical actually. That was based on a classic play. It was called uh, "Enter the Guardsman," which was based on Molnar's *The Guardsman*. Right. Um, the artistic director of the theater, Bonnie Monty, said to me, "You can do Shakespeare. Do you? Would you? Are you interested in that?" And I'm mm -hmm. like, "Oh my gosh, yes, yes!" And so she gave me Antony and Antony and Cleopatra. That was the first Shakespeare I ever did. Terrifying. Yeah. But I, I. I learned uh, everything I could before I did that. And I, I credit her with opening that door for me. Right. And which opened one, one door after the, after the other for uh, an acting career on top of a singing career. So I, I spend most of my time, uh, well, 50-50, like half doing musicals and half doing uh, classic plays or, or contemporary plays, straight plays. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about uh, the worlds of film and television and things of that nature as well, dabbling in those areas too? Oh yeah, it's uh, it's still a nut that hasn't fully cracked yet, but it has um, it has on occasion, and I've gotten I've been able to do some really good work on both those venues, film and TV. Uh, I would like to um, see more of that happen. What would be some things that people might uh, remember you from film and television? I've done pretty much every soap opera that was shot in New York. Yeah. First of all. Um, another another world too? <laughs> uh, no, I didn't do another world. That was shot in California, I think. I think Brooklyn. Yeah. Oh, it was it? Yeah. Another it world. was Brooklyn? It was Brooklyn. It had, you know, those big warehouses in Brooklyn? Another yeah. No, I did. Um, I've done. I did Loving and All My Children and Guiding Light, and I've done recurring roles on all of those. As the world turns, and I was actually on. I was on Baywatch. That's right. I was the most clothed person on that <laughs> set. Um, what was that like? It was a blast. It was a blast. Uh, I really. I had a great, great time. You remember what uh, the role was? What was happening? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, why? Why I say I was the most clothed person on the set was because not only did I always have all my clothes on, but I had my face wrapped in a bandage because I was a burn victim. Yeah. Uh, so I had. I looked like I'm like you know the mummy, and but I did finally get to take it off, and I was all scarred and everything. Um, but it was very much a. Um, uh, almost like an Edgar Allan Poe sequence. But I've done that, I've done sliders, I've done uh, uh, more to date, I've done elementary and I've done uh, The Sinner. I've done a couple of episodes of The Sinner, the first the uh, the first season of that. Probably Law um, and Order too, right? You know, I'm one of the only actors in New York that has never been on Law and Order. You know, I've been on it too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see you know what I mean? I, I've been on Law and Order. Yeah, they, they film it, what, the Law and Order Way there, Chelsea Piers in Manhattan. Yeah, yeah, and they exactly. Have, not yet, huh? <laughs> no, it hasn't. No, I don't know what the heck. So, so. <laughs> Got to <call> central casting. <laughs> right. That's it. Yeah, I was a, uh, was it a court officer? They had me as a court officer in the courtroom during one of the cases. Kind of cool. Uh, and then another one that was uh, on FX that had a really good premise to it. And I was uh, cast as one of the administrators for college and uh, they filmed it at a college in Westchester, New York. And it was a, it was a really cool series that uh, was sort of short lived. It was called Lights Out and it was on FX. 
And uh, it was about this boxer, this ex-boxer who was a lot older and he was retired now. But there was um, something with his daughter, either she needed money to be able to, you know, advance her life with schooling or she was ill. So he decided, and it was kind of risky, to come out of retirement and go back into the ring to be able to generate the money for the daughter's needs. That was a really cool uh cool thing and to be mm. a part of the set and working with everybody as well and of course i think the, i remember the name of that series FX and lights yeah. Out. yeah it was a really yeah. cool cool crew and everything uh they love the hallmark channel they said you should be a hallmark movie actor <laughs> thank you <laughs> right to them right because <laughs> <laughs> that's all the sweet you know more pleasant Lifetime, I think it's more where the baby is kidnapped or you're the jilted you know, lover and, you know, you're cheating on the wife or whatever is going on. More, yeah. more of that happening on, on the Lifetime movie network, more of those more crime and things of that nature. But Hallmark is more of the, I guess, good natured sort of Christmas and, yeah. you know, you're the, the sweetheart guy next door type thing. That goes with your theme of positivity, right? So. I know I should be on the Hallmark Channel. We got to get exactly. the, show on the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> the oh, love it, you got to get him on the whole. You got to get get him on too. Get some calls going here, folks. Come on, Merlin and the rest. Call Hallmark. Get us on the uh, the channel there. Um, so television, film as well, a little bit. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've done uh, I've done a couple of films. Um, just finished doing. A, it was a sort of a docu drama on Columbus. Uh, which was uh, really kind of interesting. It was a it was a uh, a good a good film. Short. It was a short film, but it was uh, it was had a lot to say. Mm, yeah. Right. Absolutely. So, uh, is that out or coming out or? Uh, it is not. Well, it's it's being promoted, but it's not fully out yet. I mean, there's they have had showings of it, but uh, but nothing major. Just be yeah. probably a stream situation, you think, more than likely? Right now, yeah. Yeah, it'll start out as a stream. We have some cool photos here that we've collected and love uh -oh. to uh oh, yeah. We dug oh, deep. You didn't clear me, you didn't clear them with me. <laughs> <laughs> we have the very first picture when uh the doctor came in and slapped you. No, <laughs> we don't go back that far. We've I don't even have that one. <laughs> we have a, a, an array of different ones. So we'll sort of weave in and out of your illustrious career, Robert. Um, here we go here. That was, uh, uh, that was a play called Temporary Help. That was off Broadway. Mm. And that's Chad Allen. Oh yeah, on the right. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, Chad Allen. That's right. Yeah, it was a TV series he was in too that was really popular, and I forget what it was. I yeah, know. I forget it too. It yeah. was it was a really popular yeah. series. Yeah. Yeah. Here's another cool one, Limiz. Yeah. That's now I mean, Chavere. what was I mean? We're we talking about legends here. What was it like being in Les Mis? It was extraordinary. I mean, yeah. it was it was um, uh, it was a a powerful piece. Yeah. And uh, and to be able to sing that music and uh, and to do and to play this guy was um, was really extraordinary. I mean, I I I would say that I am my my forte is playing darker characters mm. that are um that go through transformations or uh conflict uh, go go through conflict um and and either come out positive on the other side or or not but um Definitely more Lifetime Movie Network than Hallmark. <laughs> yeah, it's not really Hallmark. It's, yeah, it's more, much yeah. more, yeah, much more Lifetime. I'll, uh, take, I'll, I'll take Hallmark too, but I mean, it's- Phone it's, rings, you know, your phone exactly. rings. Exactly. But this this was, uh, how, how long did you play this role? I played that for a year, one month, and two days. Mm, yeah. 
And, and you're yeah. going to ask me, why do I know that? I would say it's because it was such a joy and a blessing that you just soaked it all up. And it was like, you were still, you know, in awe of the character and of the production and everything that came with it. Well, that's part of it. But the other, the other reason was that they, they signed one, they signed, uh, they signed people to a three month contract in Les Mis in those days. So I was um, signing three month contracts. I had just signed another three month contract when I was hired for Jekyll and Hyde. Mm. And the, um, the general manager, Richard J. Alexander, the man I was telling you about who cast me in the show. And who's had this brilliant relationship uh, collaborating with Barbara Streisand all these yeah. years. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, he saw what the, the potential was for me in, the, in Jekyll and Hyde. And he released me from my contract, which he did not have to do. Um, so I knew, uh, so I, I knew exactly how many, uh, how, how long I was in that show because I had to leave at a specific time. Yeah. Yeah. So you knew and because other things were waiting. Jekyll and Hyde. I was, oh, yeah. I got cast in Jekyll and Hyde. So wow. it was, uh, yeah. I was going immediately into yeah. the tour of that. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So it must've been sort of bittersweet a little bit. Uh, no, it was, I, well, it was fully sweet. I mean, I, 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 yes, bittersweet in that I, I, I loved everybody that I was working with. Um, you never forget your first, you know, that was my, that was my Broadway debut and that, yeah, yeah. that it had a, it had an indelible mark, you know, that is still on me. Yeah. But I had a feeling that I mean, doing Jekyll and Hyde was was like the uh, I I had a feeling of what it was going to be. Mm, yeah, yeah, and uh, it absolutely turned out to be that. So yeah. when you got cast in Jekyll and Hyde, that had to be, you know, <laughs> that had to be amazing. Yeah, it was pretty exciting. And there you are. It was pretty exciting. Yeah. Tell us Went about through a lot to get there. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Tell us about what they're seeing on the screen here. Uh, well, that's uh, that's Doctor Jekyll. Mm. Um, he's he's a very intense fellow. Uh, he's uh, uh, you know very much uh, brilliant scientist. Um, very much all heart and all head. Absolutely. Yeah. Jennifer asks, "Have you ever seen a theater ghost?" Uh, seen one, no. Felt it? But um, I, I guess I've felt it a little bit. Uh, I have one story for you. We were, um, we were doing a play called A Moon to Dance By, uh, by Tom Thomas. And I was doing it with Jane Alexander and with Gareth Sachs. And we were at the Pittsburgh Playhouse, which I believe is um, is uh, credited as the most haunted theater in America. Um, so we were in the basement rehearsing, um, and we went on a break. And the 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 basement was you know many different rooms and everything. It wasn't dark or scary or anything. It was just different rooms and. Uh, kind of a labyrinth of of rooms down there, and we went on a break, and uh, we came back from the break, and Jane said, "I just got my ass pinched," and we <laughs> all just looked at her like, "What?" She said she went to uh, get a drink of water. She bent over in the water fountain to get a drink of water, and she felt her butt getting pinched. A little bit of a jolt. <laughs> and she turned around and there was nothing there. There was nobody there. <laughs> so we all had a good laugh about that. At least, you know, the ghost had good taste. Yeah. Everybody said, it wasn't I. It wasn't I. <laughs> I'm over here. I don't, my arms are not that long. <laughs> that yeah. Is, that is no, I've heard, I've heard stories, uh, yeah. but I've never, I've never fully experienced yourself. 
Yeah. Well, I did once at up at uh, up at Goodspeed uh, in Connecticut, which is a uh, it's a beautiful old opera house. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. East but it wasn't, but it wasn't in the theater. It was one of those. It was one of those uh, mansions where they used to put up the actors. And you got uh, pinched? <laughs> no, but I had I had it some mischief done in my room. Uh, back to the cassette tapes again. I had a bunch yes. of cassette tapes in boxes. And um, I went off to rehearsal. I closed the door. I locked my, my door. And I came back after rehearsal. I opened my door, unlocked it, opened the door. And my cassette tapes were strewn all over my room. Mm. Um, and, and underneath the bed and everything. So I had a, I had a mischievous ghost. Mm. Yeah, but not just having fun. Good speed opera, very familiar with it. Uh, yeah. beautiful, beautiful place. I don't know if June told you, actually, we were at a uh, at a writer's colony that they have. I don't know if you've ever been. Yes. Part of yeah. No, I know, I know the one you're talking about. And I was never a part of it. Pepe was there, Pepe Castro, and a whole group. And it was really, really fantastic. I was invited to go. And, you know, you stay in your own room, your own sort of like little house. And it was really, really cool. And everybody sort of engages one another and they sort of uh, do mini versions of what they're creating in front of each other and everybody sort of uh, brainstorms and mm -hmm. really, really, really fantastic. And uh, again, you know, all of that right now is on pause. The, the good speed, everything's on pause. Yeah. Hoping yeah. that we get through everything here. Um, got some yeah. fabulous photos here. This one's cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, that's Jacques Brel. Yeah, that's right. That's Jacques Brel is alive and well and living in Paris. That theater is uh, unfortunately no more. That was a uh, that was the Zipper Theater, mm. uh, which was on Thirty Seventh, Thirty mm -hmm. Eighth Street between Ninth and Eighth and Ninth Avenue. And uh, yeah, that's unfortunate. It was a it's that was a really extraordinary place. It was a great venue. Mm, yeah, yeah. And it looks like uh, you were having a great time too there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how about a little Othello? Uh, yeah, that's Iago. Mm. What was it like being a part of that? That was extraordinary. That was one of the most difficult parts I've ever played. Was I still. Really? I still don't. I still can't figure that guy out. I mean, what was it that made it extra difficult? You think? Well, because there's there's no clear reason. Yeah. As to why he does what he does. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's um, which was which was fascinating, because it created a very different feel for me nightly. Mm. Um, I would lean in one direction one one day, and then I'd, I'd feel I would go with whatever I was feeling the next day, and it would it would uh, which which you know actors do anyway. But I mean, with him in particular, it was so it was so fluid because there was no real clear path. You had to you had to latch onto something to to make it make sense. Mm. How much? Uh, I mean. Did that take a lot out of you uh, doing that role? I mean, being so wrapped up and invested in it. Uh, yeah, and it was also the most words I've ever had to say. It's yeah. uh, it's yeah. it's. I think he's. Yeah. Well, maybe. I think Richard the Third is the most. I can't remember which is. I can't remember the the list, but Richard the Third is is up there Iago and also Antony and Antony and Cleopatra. So it's there, there it was a lot. But mm. yeah, it was it took a lot of energy. It took a lot of energy. Marsha loves that little bit of gray in your hair, she said. <laughs> There's more and more. There's more and more <laughs> every day. That's it, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well learned by all of us. Um look at that one. That's a cool shot. Tell us about this one. Yeah, that was a new musical called Cut Man. Um, it was about a, a young Jewish boxer, uh, and I played his father, and I was his I was his cut man. So uh, I would anytime he got you know wounded in the ring, I was I was there to fix him up and send him back out there again. Um, 
that had some great potential. That was that was uh, that was being worked on before Rocky came on the scene. Before Rocky came became a, a musical. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so that had some great potential. Unfortunately, it didn't uh, it didn't come to fruition. Right. Yeah. Which which happens. Which which happens. You know, ninety five percent of the time. I mean, it's right. there are a lot of great. A lot of great things out there. A lot of great pieces that never get to see the light of day, and it's unfortunate. Johnny here says, uh, "You know, one of his favorite actors and people. He loved working with you." You're oh, Johnny! Yes. Yeah. yeah. I know, <laughs> Johnny. Mm -hmm. It's so good to see you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's been watching our series as well, and we appreciate that. Um, great photos. There's a couple of other comments that I wanted to show here that came in somebody had a question uh mona is watching hello to jim and robert from louisiana wonderful hey, louisiana. and um christopher had asked what a great career did you get to work with linda edder uh edder yeah with a d it's right. um yes i i did that with in jekyll and Hyde. we worked together that's how we met just as uh, Mar uh, Marsha had spelled it, uh, played the part of Lucy Harris opposite Robert in mm -hmm. Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah, that's she, right. She remembers she was there. That's cool. And here's another great one, Dr. Osborne. Spider yeah, that was a fun, that was a fun one too. <laughs> Tell us about that for folks who haven't seen this one. Uh, that was, uh, that was Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark, which was, uh, done on broadway i can't remember when it opened but i ended up replacing uh patrick page in in this role in these roles yeah. and um who was phenomenal in the roles and uh he's a very good friend is a phenomenal actor mm -hmm. um but it was it was very exciting to play to to play with the that group of people and to play uh, that those characters and um, on such a in such a piece because it was just a wild ride. It was uh, yeah, yeah. It was pure entertainment. It was pure entertainment, and it was it was a blast every night. I had a Did great you time. Ever bump into any of the colleagues, former colleagues from EF Hutton, who have seen you in these productions? They're like, oh my God, we're actually glad you left. You, you yeah. <laughs> I would, I would imagine, you know, you were an albatross around our necks. I was glad you left. Uh, actually, yes, uh, not not recently so much as earlier earlier on in my career. Uh, that my boss, the guy who handed me my um, my bonus, his name was Jack Miller, uh, and uh, he came, surprised me came to see uh, and the world goes round and met me after the show he came to he st stayed in the lobby and I ran into him after the show and he said I guess the advertising's working out really well mm -hmm. and uh, he said I'm I'm very happy for you he said it was very happy for me and very proud of me and yeah so it's I, I've um, I have uh, friends, actually, that you know, broker friends that uh, I, I'm still friends with. Then I'm still very much right brain, left brain. I have a lot of a lot of friends who are not in theater, and you know, many friends who are in theater. So I, I keep I keep my hand in both worlds, my feet in both worlds. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Which is a good thing. I think it's a smart thing. Here's another one, 1776. Tell us about this role. Yeah, that's Dickinson. Um, from Pennsylvania, uh, I've gotten to play. <clears throat> pardon me. I, I played um, Rutledge from South Carolina. I got to sing "Molasses to Rum" when I was younger. Um, uh, one of my one of the first roles I did at Paper Mill Playhouse uh, in New Jersey, and um, but then I, I ended up getting cast as as this guy, and uh, I love this role. Mm. It's a uh, it's another one of those another one of those um roles that really goes through uh uh turmoil mm. and has to and has to 
come to a reconciliation at the at the end of it and uh uh it's a it was a it was a great role i really enjoyed it that's fantastic and that's the key that's what it's all about i mean the amount of roles and work is extraordinary here we go here hamlet that's hamlet that's mm. uh claudius with my gertrude mm. jackie antimarini mm. that was at uh the new jersey shakespeare shakespeare theater new jersey rather. Mm. it's incredible huh especially when you look back you know it's almost like this is your life a little bit when you're looking at these these photos and all these great memories tell us about yeah. this one ben rumson uh yeah this is ben rumson this is uh paint your wagon um paint your wagon is a show that never really worked uh it's got uh, learner and low it's got phenomenal music but the book just never really no one ever really found a good book for it yeah uh so i this was i was involved with a production of this which was at uh the fifth avenue theater in uh seattle mm -hmm. and uh a new book by john marins uh who did a phenomenal job with it and is still working on it um and it's uh it's uh, i it was uh it was a great role you know like i said terrific music and um and i think they're finding a they're finding a way into into that show and i think it's it's worthy and it should be it should be done i mean it needs to be back on stage again i don't think it's been ever it's hardly ever been revived hardly ever mm. there's another one anthony. that's anthony and anthony and cleopatra that was my first shakespeare mm. Taken on quite a role there. Were you uh, were you intimidated at all by the roles? Uh, terrified. <laughs> I was terrified. I, I know I sort of softened it with the word intimidated, but <laughs> oh no, terrified. I, but but that was a good thing because it scared me into working my butt off. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's how and goes, right? I have a very dear friend of mine who is another mentor. His name is uh, William Metzo. And he's a phenomenal Shakespearean actor, classical actor. And I leaned on him heavily and he coached me. Uh, he coached me well for that, for that role. Mm. On top of being beautifully directed by Bonnie Monty, I was, you know, I had to learn a lot. I had to learn a lot about the, the verse and about Shakespeare and how to do it and about punctuation and about, I mean, I didn't go to school for any of this. So it's all been, like I said, trial and error. It's all been learning as I'm doing it. Mm. Which is cool, right? I mean, you pick up these little nuances along the way and you probably add the, the things that you learn to the various characters. How much of yourself is in the characters you play or are you not able to deviate at all? Because, I mean, obviously everybody interprets a song differently. Everybody interprets what they read differently. How they present themselves differently but are you able to deviate it all and add your touch on these roles certain roles yes certain roles no well it all it's all yes because uh i mean the only way that one can play a role truthfully right is to have themselves have have put themselves in it right you know have their sensibilities become these characters uh and that's quite frankly the only reason that you can see all these plays that are classic plays that are done over and over again with different actors and they're all different because every actor brings a different no one's no two actors are the same no one's going to bring the exact same i may watch i may watch somebody else's performance say i love that moment that they did and try to replicate it it will never come out the same way mm -hmm. uh it's going to be filtered through my own sensibilities and so uh yeah i always i always put myself in it right for better or for worse i always put myself in it has anybody ever said not to or no yeah no. do it yeah no you have you you have to i mean that's that's part of our craft right exactly you know, putting fine. I always I, I equate it to sort of a 
every every roll is a is a different Rubik's cube. Mm -hmm. You know, all the colors are the same because they're my colors, but the way you the way they get turned around and they are never show up the same way. Right. You know, so all the all the squares are always they're mine. They're always they're always my my red squares and blue squares and white squares and whatever, but they're never in the same order. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's my brilliant analogy. Right. Sunsets <laughs> every day, but each sunset is unique. Yeah. Uh, each snowflake out of the sky is unique. Exactly. Right. Here we go. Here, Jesus Christ. Super -super. That's no. That's not. That is. Um, uh, that's uh, the play that I was telling you about with uh, uh, Jane Alexander and Gareth yeah. Sachs. That's yeah, uh, a it, moon to it, dance by. This one is the Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's Jesus Christ which, superstar, which definitely is. Yeah, that makes more sense. <laughs> it doesn't look. Uh, it's, the, it's the laurel wreath that gives it away. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it is. Um, so what was it like playing that role too? Again, another unique, yeah, you're very versatile. You have the a great ability to take on the different looks, the different characters, the different personalities and just sink your teeth really into them. Yeah. That's what I love about, that's what I love about theater. That's what I love about acting. Yeah. You know, you, you can just embody so many different beings, you know, and, and it's, uh, it's fascinating. I love uh, uh, I love delving into psyches, you know, and what makes characters tick and what makes people tick. Uh, and so this is it's the perfect occupation for me, really. Jane is here watching. She was on a couple of weeks ago. Oh, hey, Jane. Yeah, she was a great guest. Uh, hi, Bob. Great to see you. Looking fabulous. Good memories. Can't wait Thank to you back. Bernadette is here. Hello, Jim, Robert, and all the loveties. Great to see you. And uh, Johnny says, I love that analogy. Juanita, uh -huh. Juanita in South Africa, great pictures. What a wonderful uh, journey. Uh, terrific, of course, in uh, Jekyll and Hyde. Hearts from Jennifer Barry. Thank you. June says hi to Jane. Hi, June. <laughs> and um, really, really cool. I mean, when you, when you see the body of work, it's... Uh, it's absolutely extraordinary and Thank you. more here. Tell us about this one. That's um, yeah, that's one of my favorite roles. It's uh, I, uh, I think I said earlier on that one of my, one of my big moments was I got to do the Rothschilds, uh, which is a, a, Sh a Sheldon Harnick, uh, Jerry Bach musical. Uh, that was, uh, it's a it's a wonderful musical that never really um, had much of a future because it happened after Fiddler on the Roof and it always got compared to Fiddler on the Roof and that was just it just was unfortunate. Mm. Um, but it's a it's a beautiful piece within itself with uh, some wonderful music which uh, many people would probably know in my own lifetime, uh, which is one of the more famous songs in it. But um, like I said, I got to play the middle child, Nathan, uh, earlier on in my career. And um, that since that time, that musical had gave, uh, it's always been a part of my life somehow. It's always been very important to me because it's about family. Mm -hmm. And whether it's whether it's because I'm Italian or whatever, I mean, it, or it's just me, family is very important in my life. And uh and i guess that's that's why that that musical always meant so much to me and uh the people in the cast were i mean I've, i was friends with with all of them i still have with many of them but uh later on not too long ago uh in 2015 uh sheldon harnick uh who god bless him i want to be him when i grow up uh is still working still creating um and got together with the book writer the original book writer sherman yellen who i also want to be when i grow up and uh our producer uh, arnold middleman and our director jeffrey moss and they re 
thought the show. Uh, they rewrote the show and made it for a smaller cast. They made it for, um, they made it focus more on the family, uh, the father, the mother, and the five boys. And um, Shelton Harnick wrote two new pieces, two new songs. He wrote uh, both the lyrics and the music for, for these songs. And they asked me to play the father. They asked me to play Meyer Rothschild, which I jumped at because I always remembered that character and I always felt like I wanted to play that character. Um, so we did that at the York Theater in, I think it was 2015. Uh, had a wonderful, successful run, run at the York uh, in, in Manhattan. And uh, then we ended up doing it at London's West End, uh, off West End, actually. It wasn't the West End, it was off West End, kind of there off Broadway um, in 2018, January of 2018. Uh, and we had a wonderful acclaim there too. We're still trying to get the piece uh, on Broadway uh, or in a, a large off Broadway venue. So, uh, Hopefully we'll be able to do that, but it's 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 a really worthy piece, and it's something that that people love when they do see it. Mm, absolutely, it was actually filmed for Lincoln Center. Our uh, oh, production, see. yeah, our production at the York Theater was filmed, and it's at Lincoln Center Library. Unfortunately, you can't see it right now because it's. I think the library is closed, but uh, eventually you'll be able to do that. Mm -hmm. You can at least go there and see it. The library went silent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For all the wrong reasons. For all yeah. the wrong reasons. There um, we go. There's, there's Pilot again. Mm. Now, what was it like being a part of this? Again, another incredible opportunity for you. Fabulous. I mean, I did this, this particular picture is from uh, uh, Pittsburgh Civic Light Opera, Pittsburgh Civic Light Opera's production of it. But I've played this role a number of times. I, I played it out at uh, uh, Paper Mill Playhouse about three three times at Paper Mill Playhouse. And I've played it uh, here at, um, at the Benenham Center in Pittsburgh. Uh, it's one of my favorite roles. I mean, it's that's another one. You know, it's conflicted characters, uh, you know, not who, not who he seems to be. Yeah. It's, uh, it's and phenomenal music. Yeah. Absolutely. You like that challenge where the role isn't just so cut and dry, where there's all these different nuances of the person's personality, right? Yeah. No, I can't play, a, I can't play a two dimensional character. It's just, it's, there's no, I would always find something else. I would, if he's, you know, just a totally good guy, I'd find something wrong with him. Yeah, <laughs> if he's a if he's a, just a totally bad guy, I find something good about him. Whether he likes puppies or something, I don't know. I would find uh, I'd find another dimension. Mm hmm. And that's and that's great because again, it, it's the it's really the challenge of it, right? That uh, you really enjoy. Yeah, totally. Because it yeah, challenges just, you. What's that? It challenges you as well. To it does. Yeah, totally. I mean, just to. It if all I see is two dimensions, it forces me to dig deeper. Right. There's got to be something else. There's got to be something else, even if it's not written. There's got to be something in there. What role have you taken on that altered you or changed you, either your way of thinking or just your observation of life, the most that had the deepest impact on you that really i mean i'm sure many of them if not all but this was the one that really you know whenever i think about this one it, it goes deep for me is there a particular role that you've taken on um that still is that one that has left this effect on you this impact on you That's a, that's a good question. That's a, that's a challenging question. And I, I, 
I don't know that I have a real clear, concise answer for you. Um, yeah, this is, may sound as a cop out, but I there's many have challenged me, and many have uh, caused me to think differently. Um, uh, yeah, I have a hard, I'm, I'm having a hard time finding one in particular. There, are there a couple that uh, rank high for you in that area? Yeah. Um, I don't know, Jim. I'm gonna have to. Th I'm gonna have to come back to that one. You want to phone a friend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be better if I had someone telling me. You know, you were really you. You you came out a much better person after you did this. It did. So it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm a generous host. You can phone a friend. Yeah, I need to ask Lila. She would. She will know. She'll know better than me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Ask the others who write. Yes, exactly. Yeah, they might know. Uh, here's another. Yeah, you know that was one of the ones that was coming to mind. Uh, this is yeah. called "White Guy on a Bus," mm -hmm. um, and it was uh, we did that. This was before Black Lives Matter. Yes, uh, and. This is a it's a it's an incredibly powerful piece, and um, this was something that was that I felt was really worthwhile uh, to do, and you know it it created it created conversations, which I love. Right. You know when people when I get to do something that can that people go out of the theater and they just want to sit and talk about the piece and talk about what just what they just saw tell us um, uh, about what the piece was about for those who didn't see it well it's about um uh it flashes back and forth between present and past yeah and uh this gentleman is uh well, he's sort of the epitome of white privilege. Mm -hmm. um, uh, however, he's very liberal. Um, and uh, he's got a wife and he's got a daughter. No, he's got a son. No, sorry. He's got a wife and he's got a, a, a very close neighbor who he considers like a son mm -hmm. um, who is married. And uh, what we find out is that all these scenes that are happening with the wife is in the past. Right. And what we find out is that she has been killed hmm. by, uh, by a man mm -hmm. uh, who is now in prison and this guy, this character, uh, ends up riding a bus mm. daily. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of a bus to nowhere. It's a bus that goes to the uh, local penitentiary, mm -hmm. kind of ends up at the, at the penitentiary. And then he rides it back again. And he ends up meeting this young lady on the bus who is going to this penitentiary to visit her brother who is who is uh, incarcerated there mm -hmm. and what we find out is that um her brother i don't believe he's in the same cell but he's in the same cell block as the guy who killed my wife mm. and he my character wants to offer her this young lady money to pay her brother to kill him mm. uh, and it is a um, it's a powerful piece about race mm 
mm. and uh, about race relations and um, uh, how I, I certainly, I certainly, yeah, I, I certainly came out. A, I came out a more thoughtful person. Yeah, from doing that. How long um, did it run? Well, we we it originated at uh, Delaware Theater Company in Wilmington, mm -hmm. um, and we ran there for about a month, mm. and then we moved to uh, Fifty Nine East Fifty Nine Theaters uh, here in Off Broadway. Yeah, uh, and it ran there for about I would say four to six weeks, maybe four weeks. Um, and it got, uh, it got, it was a critics pick, yeah. New York Times critic pick and, um, got really good, really good notices, uh, and started lots of conversations. I mean, I went out with people afterwards and we would talk about this piece and, uh, yeah. Yeah. you know, in many different ways, you so know, it was, it's timely and topical and, yeah. Relevant, uh, yeah. and, and even this year even more absolutely um, yeah so this happened right be this happened before you know black lives matter became uh, matters become became uh as powerful as it as it is just on the cusp absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, merlin says wow how deep is that absolutely yeah. and uh June says, Bob, I'm finding out so much more about you. Wow. <laughs> that means I'm doing my job, June. Yeah, that's that's true. Mona, thank you. I appreciate that. Glad you're enjoying it in uh, Louisiana. Um, here's another great one. Oh uh, yeah, that was that was a, this is another great play. This is called Snow Orchid, um, which we did uh, at the Lion Theater here off Broadway. Mm. Um, and this was a man who, uh, has, um, well, he has mental issues, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, had served, he served time and he comes back, back home and, um, I don't know, phone's going to. Uh-oh, he's calling you right now. <laughs> he's calling you now. Uh -oh. <laughs> no, no, no. The phone's going up. Shush, 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 shush. Blah, shush. Blah, 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 Jingle bells, jingle bells. <laughs> Cover up the phone number, right? I told you not to call me. That's it. <laughs> we uh, yeah, it was another, it was another, it was another great, Jamie play, was a great role play. On the other night. So, I'm sorry, who was? Jamie Duroy. Oh, Jamie's terrific. And we had a blast. Hilarious. And... Um, she was on and there was something with her phone. <laughs> she, I guess, it was sort of like an Alexa type situation or whatever, but it was, it was a scenario where the phone was listening to her and then all of a sudden she's in the middle of the conversation and the phone says, I'm sorry, I don't quite get that. Could you please repeat? Scary. <laughs> Technology is scary. Like, what the hell's going on here? I thought I turned this darn thing off. What is this? It was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I have a friend of mine who, uh, in a costume fitting, he took his he took his phone out. He turned it off, put it in his in his pocket, and during the costume fitting, ended up having a conversation about I don't know. It was it maybe it was about Lord and Taylor or something like that. Yeah, and. Uh, once turns his phone on, and all of a sudden, all these ads stop popping up for Lord and Taylor. Like, that's how you I, you yeah. were off, and you're yeah. still listening to me. Isn't it amazing? It's, it's everything pretty... is off, right? Supposedly not being tracked and everything. Yeah, no. Mm -mm. Merlin says phone company ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Pinched me on my butt. Well. <laughs> <laughs> when your uh, when your phone rang, the viewers or Lovities thought it was their phone ringing. <laughs> They're checking their phones too. That's, that is funny. We're just making sure that you're following along, everybody. Uh, Sky Masterson. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was a fun roll. Tell us about that. That's cool. Yeah, that's a that's a fun roll. Mm. Uh, so uh, yeah, I just that's one of my favorites. 
Yeah. Again, again, terrific music. Now, talking about the versatility, my friend. There we go. Yeah, there's the Green Goblin. Mm. How long did it take to get, you know, outfitted for that? Uh, well, that had to be done at intermission. So we had right, yeah. roughly 10 to 15 minutes. Mm. Uh, I had uh, two people doing my makeup. Mm -hmm. uh, all that stuff was paint is a, is a prosthetic that's glued on three pieces, four pieces plus the headpiece um that's glued on and then painted around and then i had two wardrobe people uh put me into that space suit um you know with the boots and the yeah it was it was uh that was a challenge to have a to be able to wear a costume and not have the costume wear me All right so because it's just it was such a just to figure out how to move in it and what what it did and and what I looked like when I did what I wanted to do it was uh, it was it was fun. Was it hot and was it heavy? Yeah, both. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, it, yeah. It had to be. Uh, you must have been exhausted after at the end of a night, huh? Uh, I was sweaty. Yeah, <laughs> but it, yeah. it's a good uh, good workout. It was a good workout, but it was a cool costume. And then, of course, Phantom. Yeah, Phantom. Oh, just to just to back up for um, uh, the Green Goblin for a second. We uh, uh, on Halloween, they took me out into Times Square. I had uh, I had a couple of people with me and to bodyguard me. And I went out into Times Square, and I had those guys dressed up as superheroes mm, yeah. want to pay me to have a picture with me. Really? Yeah, it was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yeah, that could yeah, I could see that if you were walking around Times Square, you would be very popular. Yeah. When, uh, All of a sudden, Batman wanted to have a picture with the Green Goblin. You are now competing with <laughs> <Cookie> Monster. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Holy and, and Elmo. Yeah, right. Exactly. That is funny. Uh, Sherry says uh, when your phone rang, she thought maybe it was your friend phoning you as opposed to you phoning the friend. For the right. Year. Yeah. They're, 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 they're watching out for me. That's it. Bernadette says uh, such a well done costume and makeup. Yeah, when it was brilliant. Juanita in South Africa. Wow, great costume. Kathleen Walker in New York. That's cool. Cool stuff. It really is. And then uh, the Phantom, as we mentioned. Tell us about what it was like being a part of that. Yeah, that was exciting. I mean, this was the um, this was the Maury Yeston, Arthur Copet Phantom, which uh, right. when, when uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber's Phantom of the Opera uh, came to Broadway, it's interesting how there are, when uh, when big shows show up, it, they're kind of in the ether. Yes. And many people have the same idea at the same time. I do. And there were other phantoms that were vying for Broadway at the exact same time as Andrew Lloyd Webber. And this was one of them. Um, also by a very well-known composer, you know, uh, Maury Yeston, Arthur Copet. Uh, and there were... I believe two others. Uh, there was one called the Ken Hill Phantom, and I believe that one used actually actual classical music, as opposed to uh, newly composed. Uh, so I, even though I've audition, I auditioned for more uh, 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 the Andrew Lloyd Webber. Um, I never got cast in it, but uh, I ended up doing this Phantom. Uh, in a couple of places also, but primarily at the Westchester Broadway Theater up in Elmsford, New York. Uh, and uh, I uh, I broke my foot mm. doing this during previews, mm. uh, doing a stunt, uh, jumping from a catwalk, and I broke the metatarsals of my foot. So I was out of the cast for, out of the, the show for a while, and they held the um, they held the opening for me. Did they really? They did. Um, and uh, I came back four weeks later 
to do the opening, I had I was still in the cast, so I had a boot on my foot. So I had a boot on my foot and I had a mask on my face. I was the most sympathetic character you could possibly ever ever hope for. And we ended up going running for nine nine months at mm -hmm. this dinner theater, the Westchester Broadway Dinner Theater in Elmsford. Uh, broke all sorts of records. This was the East Coast premiere. Mm. And just a uh, just a, a sidebar, uh, that that theater, the Westchester Broadway Theater, is now closing. Oh, they yes. they are That's shutting bad. their doors as of last week, I believe. Because of the lack, they couldn't survive past the uh, being closed because of COVID and everything. Or? Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, they're um, the industrial park where they are housed. Uh, would not renew their lease uh, because they, well, they haven't been able to pay their rent, but yeah. would not renew their lease. And so uh, this institution that has been around for decades and has overcome so many, uh, so many, you know, bottoms. It falls and yeah, yeah. Uh, this is had to succumb to, to this and it's, it's, heartbreaking and it's a shame and this is like one of the one of my theater homes you know they, were they're, there, they're like a family yeah were there fundraisers that they try to do different things to save it or uh, i don't believe so i don't believe anything was was done and by the time i heard about it it was happening so it didn't um, there was no chance to do anything about it so all these years they've been around and then this happens and then the landlord doesn't want to flex and boom yeah, so yeah. There's a chance of them. They'd rather make it into a, a warehouse for Amazon or something. And have somebody paying rent every month. Corporation. Uh, is there a chance of them coming back in a different way, shape, or form elsewhere in another once once we get hopefully? Well, I don't. That's a good question. I have no idea. Yeah, I have no idea. I think that they that's something they need to um, they need to figure out if they can. Uh, Jane says 46 years. There were yeah, 40, Four, yeah, 46 or 47 years, right? Shy of the big 50th uh, celebration they would have had. Thank uh, you, Jane. Wonderful in that production. That's uh, that's sad news. Yeah, and there and there's a lot. I mean, the theaters are really uh, <laughs> they're they're hanging on. Uh, there's really nothing. They're trying to do virtual things and everything else, but those seats are empty. Uh, yeah. So many seats are empty. There is a place in Connecticut, the Kate, um, Catherine Hepburn Performing Arts Center. And uh, they've done some- near, near Goodspeed. Yes, they're in Old Saybrook, Connecticut on the shoreline. And they are just starting a few things minimally, but now everything is surging again. So, but- uh, I know there is a, there's a theater being built in Connecticut, uh, the Legacy Theater, and they're actually building it. It used to be a puppet theater. Now it's becoming a performance hall. Wow. Uh, they're actually building it for social distancing. They actually have the seats being constructed with social distancing in mind since it was the puppet theater and they, it was gutted and they're actually been building it. And this has been a project they've been working on for years. It's called the Legacy Theater. Um, and it's literally right on the water. It's beautiful. They, um, and it's gonna have, you know, Broadway, a lot of different things in it. Um, they have constructed it, repositioned the construction to include social distancing aspects, which is really amazing. And so for them, it's a little bit easier because they're, they're constructing the place they've been in the middle of construction yeah. so they could pivot and do that but for a place that's already there that has all these seats and they need to fill the seats every night or afternoon like a restaurant you know they're well it's a dinner theater so that was actually it would have been of the theaters you know according to uh bill stutler and and von n uh stutler who are the uh some of the producers up there, they they said that it would be one of the last things to come back. So uh, because because of yeah. because it's a dinner theater, also the tables and everything there, it's very hard to socially distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a very popular dinner theater out east on Long Island 
my folks would go. And I remember we all went yeah. to Philly, and it was out east. It was on, I think, the North Shore. Was it was Lake Grove or something out that way. I can't remember the name. But I can't either, but I know you're, I know you're right. Very popular. And they did all these shows like every weekend. And I remember going uh, and it was dinner and it was shows and performance. And then there was dancing. There was a lot of different, not a lot of that around anymore. Those sort of atmospheres, uh, yeah. supper clubs and dinner theaters, uh, which was a, an experience. And of course, theater in the round as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's not that many, um, there's not that many dinner theaters left anymore. It's a dying, it's a dying breed. Yeah, yeah, generation. It's an, it's an era. It's, yeah, yeah. Netflix and Hulu and Roku have, uh, and Amazon Prime taking over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> People don't leave their house. <laughs> Here's a cool one. Tell us about this one. Uh, this was another transformative uh, play. It was. Uh, uh, this was called Bike Man, uh, a 9/11 play. Mm. Uh, it was written by Tom Flynn who was a, a correspondent for CBS News. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, he ended up, he, when the, when the planes hit, mm -hmm. uh, he was living in, not too far from there, and he got on his bike and he rode down to the towers. Yeah. And he ended up going into a garage and he got trapped there. Uh, I think the tower collapsed. One of the towers, yeah, the tower, one of the towers may have collapsed. Maybe they both have collapsed. And he was uh, trapped in a garage. Hmm. Uh, he got out and he's, uh, uh, people may remember him as uh, he was, uh, he went, he got out and he went right up to CBS and he was interviewed by Dan Rather. Mm -hmm. right then and there and he still had dust on his clothes and he had dust in his hair and dust all over his face and he told his story and he made an epic poem out of it uh and uh which is called bike man mm -hmm. and uh we ma we made it into a stage piece and uh i did uh i spoke basically the entire poem uh there were uh other there were four other actors and uh they played characters that i would come in contact with uh and would also um uh would also recite from the from the piece from the poem uh but it's a very powerful piece and i was emotionally exhausted by the end of every performance so that one had, that was one of the ones you'd say also that would have uh, an impact. Uh, just yeah. To, yeah, a real. Yeah, I mean, just to live, to live that event, every single performance yeah. was, was uh, mentally and emotionally exhausting. And a lot of connection to it, you know, obviously growing up in the tri-state area, Long yeah. Island, a lot of, you know, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, being really impacted uh, and so many different levels uh, that remain today. Yeah, uh, I think anybody that's in this area, yeah, everybody was touched around the world, but sort of had a little extra being in the area, seeing the buildings all the time, just knowing people. My brother, no longer seeing them. Yeah, my brother-in-law was offered a job with Cantor Fitzgerald uh, one month before at the South Tower. And uh, he remembers going to uh, the interview in the South Tower with Cantor Fitzgerald. And uh, they wanted to hire him, but then another company offered something better and they had moved from Long Island to Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. Oh, wow. Which they did, and then they came back to New York and then the, now they're in Florida. But um, so when he didn't take that position, this was August of uh, that year, somebody else obviously took the position and it turned out that uh, not only did uh, the person who interviewed him perish, but the person that took the job perished, uh, along with 700, 800 other Cantor Fitzgerald employees. Yeah. A month before. And there was actually a, a childhood friend growing up on Long Island who was in the North Tower, and um, he lived about three blocks over 
from our house. And um, he was, uh, he just became vice president of his company, five-year-old daughter, North Tower. And he was positioned three floors above where the plane came in on the North Tower. So in and so that I think we all know or knew people that were somehow impacted by 9-11, especially in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut area. Yeah, sure. Amazing, amazing too. And I mean, it's something that you just live to remember, never forget, that's for sure. Never forget. Never forget no. Yeah. Yeah. Raleigh Durham is where I live. Beautiful area there in uh, North Carolina. So now we have another one here. This is really cool. Camelot. That's Camelot, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, after playing uh, Lancelot with with uh, Richard Harris, I got to play his role. <laughs> so this was up in uh, this was up in White Plains Performing Arts Center. Uh, so I got to play Arthur, which was that's a phenomenal role. It was uh, really enjoyable to do. Mm, that is incredible. Yeah, how long were you doing that one for? Oh, I don't know. It was a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You look very comfortable there. <laughs> now, also, in addition to that, um, of course, we have uh, this one here. Yeah, Baron Von Trapp. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a sound of music. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Music, too. Speaking of music, sound of music. Part yeah. Of, quite a few cast albums and more, huh? Yeah. Yeah, this, this is a great cast album. I'm very proud of this one. You are, yeah. That's awesome. Here's another one, too. Yeah, that's uh, that was the first album I ever produced on my own. That's that's a solo album, uh, all standards. Mm. That was a labor of love, and uh, I, I'm very proud of it. Yeah. And these could be these are available on your website, right? They are. We showed this one too. Cool stuff. These are all the covers. Yeah, they're all really good. They're all really good um, cast albums. That was old. I mean, that boy. I did that a long time ago. This is more yes and songbook. Yeah. So you really enjoy it, huh? You enjoy, you're loving this. Oh, man, Marsha says they got the CD. That's awesome. Thank you, Marsha. Mm. Hello from uh, Linden, Florida. Bernadette, love all these. Another great one. Awesome. When you play a role for a really long time, you find it hard to go back to yourself. True. Yeah. When you get attached to a particular role or do you get attached? It's almost like a question I would ask, which I have asked doctors, uh, nurses, police, firefighters, EMTs, first responders, sort of how do you take on the role of what you have to do and the immediacy of it? And then how do you then step back from what you just did, just witnessed, were just involved in that required all of your time, attention, and emotion, and how you regain uh, the sense again of who you are, and uh, not, and then not because you're doing it over and over, become numb to, to it. Uh, and I get some really fascinating answers. A lot of it is schooling and training. A lot will say something like, "Well, when I first started out in uh, med school, I used to pass out every time I saw." blood or I used to panic or I used to feel depressed if somebody died or um, so for you some of these roles that can be really deep and emotional and so much more how do you step back and, and retain Robert uh, I've I think when I was when I was younger it was more difficult because I wanted to find that emotion so much so i lived it more um you know I'd, I'd i'd be walking down the street brooding or thinking about something and it would be I, it'd be very hard to shake off what i wanted to when i wanted to just like when i wasn't on stage yeah but yeah. Uh, as i've gotten older and gotten more practiced i i can 
you know, after the show is over, I hang it up. I That's can just, I can just hang it up and, and just be me. Yeah. Cause there's times sometimes when an actor, actress, performer of any kind actually takes on the role of the character or the personality. And then they actually prefer that version more than who they really are. That happens. Oh, too. that's that's upsetting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That happens where they end up. They prefer well, like a Joan Crawford, no. who was very much the the movie actress, the film star, and created the whole image. Created yeah. the, created from Lucille Lesur to Joan Crawford, and really uh, crafted and quaffed that whole Joan Crawford image. And yeah. preferred being Joan Crawford than. Lucille Sir, the original version of one. Yeah. Seven. No, I've never had that desire. You don't look like Joan. No, <laughs> I don't. So if they paid it up, <laughs> paid it up hey, the phone rang <laughs> and they had a couple of good wigs. I mean, that's right. Hey, you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> someone gave me a good offer, sure. Pots of pot. <laughs> that's, that's it. That's it. Uh, Bernadette says you've been blessed with fantabulous roles, such a gift. Thank you for sharing all of this as well. Um, good thing, yeah, good thing in answer to the question that you're able to sort of detach. Because um, there are people who perform, who um, they perform as well because it's much as much as it is the craft and it's therapy for them where um, they would rather, they're more comfortable playing somebody else. We just had somebody on the other night that said that, who said, yeah. oh, I really prefer playing. I, I'm an actor because I like to play other people. I really don't like to expose the vulnerabilities of who I am. I don't like to oh, it's share. Very different. No, no, no. Playing, playing yourself is one of the most difficult things you could ever do. Uh, I've, I've had to do that when I do cabaret, you know, cabaret performances or concerts or things like that that's that's much harder than than playing a character true yeah absolutely absolutely is there ever been a role that you wish you got or that you passed up on or that you would still like to play i'm sure there are <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm sure that there are, but you know, I'm always, I'm always surprised by what gets offered me. Sometimes, it's like the things that I don't think about. Uh, but when I, it's like, it's like when I got offered to to do Javert. It's like the last thing on my mind, but it was the one thing that I really should be playing. So. I just kind of, um, I kind of just go with the flow. Which is the key. That's the key to it all. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. What would you say to somebody who's watching maybe live or uh, later in the archive who would be considering going into this, uh, this area of the arts and uh, maybe they are sitting at that desk right now uh, punching the numbers in or, or whatever they're doing. And uh, but they've always had a dream of entering into this world. What would you say? Obviously, a lot has changed over the years. What would you say uh, as some sort of maybe positive uh, words for them to encourage them? Well, you, I, was, I, was, I had something all set until you said positive. Uh, well, most people say if you're an accountant, stay an accountant. If you, are, if you can do anything else. That's what people say. You, know. you need to be doing that, uh, especially now. I mean, we have no idea what what this business is going to morph into. Um, it will be changed uh, by this experience. Don't know. I'm not sure how, uh, but it will be changed. Um, the nature of live performance may be changed. Uh, or not. I mean, people may realize that, that they are so hungry for live performance after this, after a year of not having it, that um, that they will clamor to come back to the theater again. 
Uh, or they may be so terrified to sit next to somebody that closely uh, in a closed environment for two, two and a half hours. I, I have no idea what's going to turn into. Um, so if, if you're thinking now about getting into theater, then uh, it's something you really need to weigh strongly. Um, I have to say that I've done a lot of uh, master classes for uh, young students who are uh, on the cusp of graduating college uh, or just have entered college with the hopes of becoming a, a, a going into theater um, and and taking the world, you know, by the scruff of the neck and and say, "Hey, I'm here," kind of a thing, and. They get they got slapped in the face with this thing, and uh, trying to keep them buoyed and trying to keep them encouraged and and trying to keep them alive and and to keep striving to keep working until working on your craft until things open up again um, is is what I've done uh, I've done a lot of and. You know, I feel for these kids. Uh, they they are, you know, their whole lives are ahead of them, and they have no idea what that's going to turn into. And then there's there are those of us who have been in it for I've been in it for over thirty five years, and I've never experienced anything like this. Nobody has, and uh, I don't know where I don't know where things are going to go. It's very unnerving when you don't have the ground underneath your feet. And that's really important. That's great advice. It really, really is. Because again, you know, you never know who is thinking about going into these areas. And, and we're talking to a veteran here who's been doing it for many, many years and has done it for the passion and the love of it. And you started, you know, in the financial world and then blending the two and then really went full on with your craft and have uh, blessed all of us with your extreme talent, Robert. And, uh, Thank you. We wish you nothing but continued success in it all. And this is just really just this just scratches the surface of your illustrious career. And uh, we thank you for everything that you've done and that you've think of the amount. Thank you, Jim. I, I look forward to the next adventure, to the next chapter, whatever that's going to end up being. Well, well, fingers crossed. You know, right, right. now it's turn the page and it's blank, but that's OK. I've I've. All my pages have been blank every time I've turned them. So right, right, which right exactly. Yeah. So and then you just fill it in as, as time goes along. It was, exactly. Yeah. Well, it was awesome having you as a guest, Robert. Really, this was delightful. Yeah, it was you, great to be here. We chatted for two hours. <laughs> wow. It was nine o'clock. I know we were talking about like an hour maybe or so, but. Yeah, it was really, uh, now that's what everybody says. They're like, hey, you know, uh, it doesn't feel like that because it's conversational and warm and we just chat and uh, it's like we're having a cup of coffee and just a toasting. You still have your uh, your cup or your mug there? Because we always toast our guests. I, I do, but I'm empty. It, it, this was water. You cannot tell me that was iced tea or, not, or lemonade. You can't tell me that's lemonade. Trader Joe's lemonade, actually, yeah. I don't know. In a martini glass? I'm sorry. We're, we're high class operation here. <laughs> <laughs> Only the best. Only the best. All right. All right. Cheers to you. Cheers to you. It was a pleasure. I hope we get a chance to. Uh, and know, to my loveties, thank you very much. Yes, all the loveties. And I hope we get a chance to get together in person once we're past all of this. Absolutely. Everybody. That would be really, really awesome, my friend. I hope the show met. Uh, your expectations and you enjoyed your time with me as much as I certainly have with you. And I appreciate all great. the time. This was great. Thank you, Jim. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. And uh, spread that lovely around town, right? The world I could will, use will. Now, all you people take care of yourselves, all right? Absolutely. Yeah. They're saying, uh, Marsha Murphy Watson, Jim, thank you for bringing Robert to us. Mary, thank you, Robert. Kathleen, impressive career. Thanks for sharing with us, Robert. Cheers H2O from Linda in Florida, June. Cheers <laughs> all. Slancha from Bernadette. 
the Irish. Salon show, yes. Uh, uh, good to see all of us, and we think it's good to see you too, Mary. Uh, thank you for uh, your life story. Juanita in South Africa, thanks, Robert, for sharing your awesome career with us. Great conversation. Stay safe. Bernadette, please stay safe and stay well, Robert. Uh, Will do. Isn't that amazing That's that that, you know, vernacular is, is what is we all we all say that now stay safe that's yeah part of what it's as much as saying have a good day now is stay safe <laughs> exactly sherry says thank you for sharing your story with us tonight robert it's been wonderful having you in lovety hall since you're a lovety now too please come back soon absolutely you're welcome back anytime sure. marilyn in wichita kansas interesting conversation so nice to share francis you also, Robert, stay well and wishing you a great night. And uh, Thanks, Francis. Jennifer in Allentown says, watch out for ghost pension. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that could get you a lot of trouble. <laughs> Absolutely. Robert, you take care and thanks for everything. And, I uh, will. Thank you, Jim. Best of everything. And we'll chat again soon, okay? You bet, my friend. And one last one. And thank you, Robert, for a wonderful evening. Loved every moment perfect. Terrific. perfect perfect way to wrap you take care we'll see you again you too thank you ciao uh, <laughs> good to have you with us and uh we hope you enjoyed this episode of the gym master show live we loved having robert here and i love this comment marcia says i'm so sorry for screaming at you when you were in the audience for jekyll and hyde screaming at robert <laughs> And uh, he's smiling right now because he sees that. And uh, mm -hmm. that's, a cool, that's a cool one, isn't it? <laughs> that's a cool one. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you. Uh, Jason, communications, master your power. Fantastic way to spend the evening. Thank you, Robert and Jim. Our pleasure. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel at Jim Masters TV. We certainly hope uh, you enjoyed yourselves tonight. And tomorrow night, we've got a... Actually, tomorrow, we've got a very special guests at a special time tomorrow we're going to be on earlier in the afternoon so for those of you who are in other parts of the world uh, like asia and australia and europe our guest is award-winning record producer john yap of j records based in london england he's going to be with us live we're going to talk about all of the artists all the music the record industry and so much more or the music industry <laughs> some of us still like to say the record industry uh although albums are coming back a little bit right lps uh, john is an amazing uh, individual and uh, he owns and operates this incredible uh this phenomenal company that is representing so many extraordinary artists and uh, some of them are really at the top of their game he's going to be here tomorrow live at 3 p.m Tomorrow's show is 3 p.m. as opposed to 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, which is our regularly scheduled time for the series. We're going to be doing the show Friday, 3 p.m., noon Eastern, uh, 3 Eastern, noon Pacific, that is, 3 Eastern, noon Pacific, and uh, Greenwich Mean Time, UK, Ireland, Scotland, England. It will be 8 p.m. So for those of you who are watching in Europe right now, if you're in the Netherlands and Sweden, places like that, I think it's 9 p.m. But uh, for the UK and for Ireland, it's going to be 8 p.m. But for us here on the East Coast or Eastern Standard Time, 3 p.m. going to be here. So don't look for us tomorrow night at 7. We're going to be on earlier, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, with uh, incredible award-winning record producer, John Yap. That's going to be fantastic. I just want to remind you as well that... Uh, Coming up on Sunday, we've got an amazing guest. Phil Coulter is going to be here, the extraordinary and legendary music producer, songwriter, musician, multi-platinum winning artist, dear friend. Phil Coulter will be here on Sunday, and that's going to be extraordinary. Uh, Monday, Bill Russell is going to be here, phenomenal lyricist, a great guy. And Saturday, Matt Stiddy is going to be live from England, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. And uh, he's a Celtic blues musician and so much more. So cool stuff, great guests and lots more. And again, we thank our very special guest, uh, Robert, for joining us here on the show today. It was a pleasure having him and a pleasure having all of you. 
Juanita says, great show again, Jim. Good night, everyone. I know the picture got a little fuzzy. I don't know. Uh, the internet is funky. The internet does what it wants, whatever it wants. Well, good to see all of you. Good night, everyone. Stay safe. Stay well. And again, we're here tomorrow earlier. We're here at 3 p.m., not 7 p.m. on Friday. We're here uh, 3 p.m. with our special guest live from London. So uh, we'll be here together um, sort of in between lunch and dinner. <laughs> a little earlier on a Friday. Have a great night, Jim. Good night, all. You too as well. And uh, I am glad I was able to get on and see everyone. We are glad you were able to as well, Bernadette. And um, Kathleen says, thanks for another great show, Jim. Thank you very much. Jason Communications, Master of Your Power, fantastic way to spend the evening. Thank you. Uh, again, feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't, at Jim Masters TV. And let's, lots of Irish crack, pinch. Good night, Jim. Thanks again. Thank you, Jim, making uh, these trying times bearable by spreading so much love and laughter. Wishing you a very good night. You too, and thank you very much. I appreciate that. Sherry says, another amazing show, Jim. That's why we tune in every day. Thank you for bringing Robert to us. You are the best. My pleasure. My pleasure. Love doing it. And if you missed any of the episodes of the Jim Master Show Live, if you want to see the Glenn Scarpelli uh, interview conversation. It was amazing. We did like two hours and 20 minutes. So many laughs. He opened up about his life. It's really cool. You may remember him again uh, as Alex on One Day at a Time, Norman Lear's CBS sitcom from the 70s, One Day at a Time. Brilliant child actor, singer. Um, he owns a TV station in Sedona, Arizona. We had a great conversation. It was really, really awesome. You can see that. That was last night. You can see that on YouTube at Jim Masters TV in its entirety. I know a lot of you wanted to see that. YouTube had a little bit of a worldwide outage or something, but the whole thing was recorded and archived. You can see it on YouTube, and it was fantastic. So if you miss anything, if you're not here live and you want to see any of the episodes, you can see them all on YouTube. Thanks for a fun night. Well, good to have you as well. Don't forget to relax. Take care of one another. Love you guys as well. We'll see you tomorrow, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, and 8 p.m. over in uh, England, Ireland, and Scotland as well uh, with our very special guest. Don't forget to smile. Don't forget to share the lovity. And don't forget to find your Zen place. Of course, my Zen place is the ocean and with family and friends and with loved ones, and so much more. Um, and of course, music, and writing, and my career, and cycling, and tennis, and all the good things. Thank you very much, Kathleen. You guys have a good night. Thank you for your time. This time, till next time, this is Jim Masters saying we will see you tomorrow night. Love you all. Have a good night. We'll leave you with this shot of the scenic ocean. We'll see you tomorrow, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, on the Gym Master Show Live. Good night. I'm back. <laughs> we have another comment that came in. 10 p.m. in South Africa. Good. A lot e a lot earlier for you, isn't it? That's a lot earlier. I want to make sure I saw that comment. I'm going to say before we say official good night, good night, because our good nights are always long here on our show. We wanted to get that in. 10 p.m., that's great. So we'll see you then. Juanita in South Africa. Once again, good night. See you later. <laughs> now the comic came in. Hold up on the singers and the orchestra. We can wait for that. We've got to read our comments first. There's a delay somewhere. Something's happening. Thanks for a fabulous night with Robert. Great conversation. Fantastic clips and stories. Jim is really blurry, but we still watch. Good night, Jim, and all the love it is. So we're going to duck out of here. Yes. You got to have levity at all costs, all the time. Good night, gang. Good night, gang.